We are truly fortunate to have uh, two speakers today. Uh, there's going to be a, a conversation about our topic. Uh, I have, you know, my very great privilege of introducing one of our newest faculty members and truly an extraordinary young woman, Professor Gay Teresa Johnson. Professor Johnson really epitomizes, well first let me back up and tell you who I am. I am Belinda Tucker, I am the Vice Provost for the Institute of American Cultures and the Institute holds all of the four ethnic studies research centers here at UCLA. And Professor Johnson's work really epitomizes uh, the new mission of the Institute of American Culture. And that is really trying to get a better look at intersections among peoples and cultures. She holds associate professor appointments in both the Department of African American Studies and the Cesar Chavez Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies. She received her BA in Ethnic Studies and Sociology just down the road at our sister campus, UC San Diego, and then, I guess she lost her mind and decided to go to the University of Minnesota <laughs> in more frigid climates to get her doctorate in American Studies at the University of Minnesota. Seeing the light, quite literally, I'm sure, she then assumed faculty positions at the University of Texas in San Antonio, and then went north to a censored campus at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and then became a Bruin yeah. last September. So we're grateful for that. Her research interests are utterly fascinating, especially given the changing demographics of this region and indeed the nation, something that we refer to as Emerging America. Professor Johnson's first book, Spaces of Conflict, Sounds of Solidarity, Music, Race, and Spatial Entitlement in Los Angeles is a history of civil rights and spatial struggles among both black and brown freedom seekers in Los Angeles. Apparently a superwoman, she has two more books coming out next year, edited books. Uh, one is Let's Get Free, Musicians in Activism in the 21st Century, and the Futures of Black Radicalism, co-edited with Alexander Lupin, which is the topic of their presentation today. Just other books in progress, articles, she's received numerous grants and awards, I won't detail all of those, and is in great demand as a speaker. I want to add that in addition to her incredible academic productivity, uh, it has not deterred her in any way from community activism. She's currently working with the Los Angeles Community Action Network to address housing and civil rights needs on Skid Row and was the 2013 recipient of the Freedom Now Award for those efforts. She is also board president of the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy. Uh, which is called CAUSE, and an advisory board member for the Golden Institute and the Rosenberg Fund for Children. Now she's going to be joined, joined by one of our illustrious PhD candidates in political science here at UCLA, Jonathan Collins. Uh, he also got an MA in our African American Studies program, which is when I first met Jonathan. Uh, he has a BA in English from Morehouse. His research interests center around race, politics, and public policy, particularly education policy. Uh, his dissertation looks at the relationship between democracy and race within the politics of urban schools. And I'm proud to say that the Institute of American Cultures have funded some of his research uh, with both a research grant and a fellowship. He's also done research on school finance policy and political attitudes around child care policy. Child care policy and something he's accomplished that I'm particularly proud of as a former runner is he's run the LA Marathon. Yay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so please join me in welcoming two absolutely incredible young scholars here at UCLA and connected to the Institute for Social Research and Ethnic Studies, Gay Teresa and Jonathan. Thank you. So uh, uh, to, to set a foundation for the conversation, I just wanted to get your thoughts on like, sort of what's your vision for black radicalism? You know, what does it look like? Uh, what, do you, what, what kind of ideas or principles are you contemplating or sort of grappling with? Mm -hmm. Like when you, when you think about uh, black rad radicalism going forward, you know, what are some of the primary ideas that come to mind in terms of thinking about like uh, resistance, systemic racism, inequality, you know, 
maybe public policy, maybe culture, art, what are some of the, 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 the things that come to the forefront? Well, first of all, thanks to everyone for coming, and I hope we have a really great discussion, all of us. I'm really happy to see everybody here, and especially pleased to have a conversation with you. So um, as to this, this first question, um, well, first, the, the, the project is a co-edited uh, book with Alex Lubin, who's um, a professor and chair of American Studies at the University of New Mexico, and he's written an incredible second book called Geographies of Liberation, which is about the Afro-Arab imaginary. Um, and he does a, a terrific history of black and Middle Eastern um, coalitions and affinities. He talks about um, Malcolm X. He talks about Ralph Bunch. He's, he, he talks about all of these people. Um, and with respect to uh, Israel, Palestine, it's an incredible book. And I, I, I would encourage everyone to pick it up. Um, but he and I were talking for some time about some of the things that have been going on in the last five years now, um, and especially with respect to like the last three years or so with Black Lives Matter, um, and uh, I mean especially that, especially the resistance to some of the other issues that we've seen as a result of the terrible descent into poverty that so many black and brown people have experienced in the United States, but also around the world. And I felt like Alex would be an incredible co-editor for the book because he also sees these issues in international perspective. And so knowing that this conversation about the worth of black life, the worth of the lives of people who are aggrieved and marginalized needed to be not just situated within the United States, but also in some kind of global perspective, I asked Alex if he'd be interested in this. Much of the reason that I even began to think about this was because of the inspiration of Cedric Robinson and his work on, in black Marxism. Cedric Robinson uh, was a colleague of mine uh, at UC Santa Barbara for 10 years, um, and he is, um, he, he's, he's incredibly understudied, in, in my opinion, uh, but ha is responsible for the inspiration of several of the scholars that we hold in the highest esteem who owe much of their kind of advanced thinking on black radicalism to the black radical tradition as he lays it out in black, black Marxism. And then uh, in, some, uh, in, in a preceding book, and then also successive books, The Terms of Order, for example, which is being reissued by the University of North Carolina Press. Um, and most recently, uh, Forgeries of Memory and Meaning, in which he, he talks about racial regimes of history. And it's, incredible, incredible body of work that Cedric Robinson has produced. And I thought that it would be incredible to link productively Cedric Robinson's generative theory of the black radical tradition with some of the things that are happening today. Why? Because he thought so much about Marxism, and he thought so much about black people's relationship to it, and the way that Marx and Engels um, imagined the role of black people in the revolution against the bourgeoisie. And one of the things that Cedric did that was so important and something that I think we should all be inspired by as well in all of the kind of work that we're doing is that he not only placed black people in the center of the development of the world economy, but he also identified what he called a conceit in Marxian theory. So what does that mean in like the everyday terms that we better know how to use? Because many of us are very well trained and we only know how to speak with each other <laughs> about these things and we need to be able to be fluent in many languages. So let me give this a shot. He, uh, in studying Marx, um, identified, as I said, this sort of conceit that is like a, an assumption that Marx made about the black about black radicalism and black resistance being only reactionary to what had been done to black people as slaves. So in other words, this tradition of black radicalism emerges in Marx and Engels' opinion as a result, as sort of a, a response, merely a response. Not that it wasn't in and of itself, it was just a response, it's extraordinary. But it was much more than that, is what he's saying. And he's saying that because he, he, he then goes back and critiques Marx and Engels 
by saying that they were wrong, actually, about the origin of, of a general response to capitalism. He says that much of the tradition that the black radical tradition is born out of actually occurs much before the, uh, the, the sort of sophistication that capitalism comes to occupy in the modern world. So even he then goes back to some sort of like heretical mo movements against the Catholic Church before the kind of um, installation of capitalism as we know it now. And he charts this even through um, resistance among women, again, before capitalism is as we know it now. And so he says, you know, this, this is the tradition from which black radicalism uh, is, is born. It's, it, and so in some ways what he's doing is he's locating it outside of capitalism as we know it. He's saying it's more than just something that is a residual response. And so therefore, it's original, it's generative, it's all of these things that are not merely a response to capitalism. And this, so, so, so this is the conceit that Cedric Robinson uh, identifies in Marx, Mar Marx's writing, that in many respects, even Marx himself, even the writing of Capital was itself a response to the tradition of radicalism that had already been, um, that had already been established. That his writing of Capital, which is, I mean, Marx, Marx and Engels established themselves as formal scholars on, on capitalism and, and revolution in part because they see themselves as two men who are describing what has happened um, but also who are um, sort of original authors, um, first time articulators of what the proletariat can do, the working class, the people who are, are, are revolting against, um, uh, against the political economy that's set up by capitalism. And so this is an extraordinary thing for a black scholar to do when he did it, I mean, and ever, really. But, but, but it's interesting that black Marxism doesn't get a lot of um, distribution or use until much later in its second edition when Robin Kelly writes the introduction to black Marxism and when uh, people start to understand it as the, as the formidable critique of, um, of, of political economy but also of Marx that it was. So I, I've always been so inspired by this. I mean, I had to write, read Black Marxism. Even now, I read it for like the ninth, tenth time, and I'm like, what? I, mean, I gotta go back and say, what did he say here? And, but have it all, that's my sort of long lead up to, to say why I wanted to make sure that we had a book that located the radicalism that we're so inspired by today, and we should be, because this is one of the largest movements, radical movements that in history, in, in, at least in modern history. Um, but, but what part of it did I want to root in black Marxism? The part where Robinson says, really the impetus for this is not only the struggles that are situated. So the situated knowledge, and what I mean by that is not just you know, book learning or whatever, but the, only, the, the knowledge that can only come from your, your, your place in the material world, that you can't know these things by studying them. You can only know these things because you've experienced them. And that knowledge is original, it's generative, it's situated. And so that is what makes these black radicals who are slaves, who are people who have nothing else but what they know, not even, they, they don't even know a better condition. They never heard of one, they never knew anybody who was part of a better condition, but they imagine they project, they divine that it's possible to have a better condition. Can you imagine? You're not working on any kind of memory of a better condition. Not in the history of the place that you've been transported to. You can't imagine what the architecture of the new freedom would look like and yet you struggle anyway. This is a kind of situated knowledge of the material conditions that you live in every day that form the black radical tradition. But also decide then that there is no way to get this through nominal means. You can't just say you're going to accept in 1877 that the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment as they've been written are, are good, especially when blacks don't really vote till 1965, right? They don't really, they don't really vote till 65, even though it says you can, I mean, the Constitution says you can vote, 
1877, the 15th Amendment, you can't vote in the South, really, until 1965 without being lynched or having to take a poll test or something like that. So really, blacks have only been, I mean, just to drive that point home, voting since 65. And so to think about what that means, to say nominal freedom is not enough. It must be the abolition of all forms of oppression, complete abolition of all forms of oppression. That is part of the black radical tradition, too. It's a standpoint that is about the situated knowledge, but also the desire to be completely free, even when you don't even know what that means. And that's the part I felt like needed to be reinvigorated in the current political moment. And so asking Alex if we could do this together, asking the particular authors that we have. So we have an amazing roster of, um, of, of veteran scholars, but also new and emerging scholars as well who are talking about black radicalism and the relevance of black Marxism to current moments and their vision of the future. So we've got, I mean, we, we got people like Angela Davis, but we've also got folks like Stephen Osuna, who's a brand new first year professor at Cal State Long Beach, who wrote, wrote an amazing dissertation on political economy and um, Zapatistas and, and, and the, the drug wars. Um, we've, we've got Francois Verges, who's in, in France, and Ruthie Gilmore, we've got a, amazing group of, of folks. Um, Greg Burris, who's at American University of Beirut, who's writing about black, um, the, the inspiration of black ra radicalism in Middle Eastern film. Um, so we knew that, that, that this could make a, a, a serious contribution to thinking about black radicalism. But so coming back to this point, and then my long answer to your short question, <laughs> is that we can't I think with black radicalism, at least the way that I think about it, the way that I hope that people are thinking about it now, is that you know in the 21st century, we're in a new situation. We've, it, it reminds me of reading about the O.J. Simpson case through Toni Morrison's work, where she says, you know, now the, the, the way that, that the media casts things, it's like they, it's, it's incredible the story, the official narratives of what black is are, you know, I mean, it's, it's incredible. That in and of itself is incredible. To think about what it is to be an unauthorized alien, the story that you have to spin to make people, just when you look at them, feel unwelcome. I mean, th there has to be an official story that's so pervasive, right? But she says also the efforts to make it unimpeachable She's talking about the O.J. Simpson case, but she's saying the effort, that's just stupefying, she, she said. And I feel like it's even more now, because that was, what was O.J.? It was 94, I think, so before some of you were born, I think. But, um, but, but now the, the media is even more rapid. It's more, and so, it, so all of these stories, the official stories that we get about what it means to be black in the United States and elsewhere, are unimpeachable from like 10 seconds in because of social media, because of Instagram, because of all of these things, which don't necessarily mean that these forms of social media are bad. In fact, if it wasn't for Twitter, then a lot of these protests that sprang up uh, uh, for Black Lives Matter wouldn't have happened as rapidly as they did. But what it does mean is that we have to be more alert than ever before and also be more confident too, I think, about our own standpoints, about what we decide black radicalism is, about its usefulness for other movements, for other standpoints, for other epistemologies. And remember that it, in the black radical tradition, people created this imaginary from ontologies, epistemologies, from archives that never will make it into the libraries, you know, but, but are, are a sort of fabric of a tradition that deserves to be reinvigorated. If no, for nothing else, then for the confidence that we have to have not to be too hesitant about what we need, what we want. Wow. Wow. Um, we, first, we just have to appreciate that answer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> like, one, I mean, <clears throat> you place us in a context. You place us in a literature with Cedric Robinson. Mm -hmm because that was kind of the question uh, I was trying to figure out when thinking about Beck, you know, who are you in conversation with? Who are you borrowing from? And then uh, to understand that it's coming from this, this place of, um, of Robinson's work on black Marxism mm -hmm. adds a lot of clarity and it adds a strong foundation to how, um, <clears throat> of, of what we expect mm -hmm. um, the framework to look like. So I wanted, 
there are a few things like I had questions and then you started talking and, and then I did questions. Developed, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a question in my mind wanting you to speak more about um, um, the use of imagination mm -hmm. and you know specifically in this moment thinking about applying this sort of fr this black Marxism framework to a current moment you know what we're supposed to uh, what 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 we imagine when we think about freedom now mm -hmm. you know because that uh, getting to what you're saying I mean this is what makes it so difficult this is what makes it so defying is the fact that you don't really know what's next you don't really know what you should be looking toward like mm -hmm. you, know, you think about you know African slaves in the, in, a, in the United States you know imagining something that they couldn't they couldn't even see you know yeah. there was just this I just know that these conditions you know aren't the conditions that define freedom and a condition that I see myself in and you know it took some you know, it took some time for all of the slaves to even be on on board with mm -hmm. the concept you know it was you know the leadership that set it apart that said that you know we want to see a different idea of what what our condition should be so initially i wanted you to speak to about speak about your your work on spatial entitlements because i love your work on spatial entitlements Thank you. <laughs> um and see and talk about how this connects to um how you're thinking about black radicalism because i think that there's something going on there especially mm -hmm. when you think about there's black radicalism but you know there is also the idea that we're, we're looking at um folks who are also forming coalitions and forming relationships with other cultures and other mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where does black radicalism fit within, you know, where does this does this this imagination fit within the ideas that they have for, you know, other folks of other cultures and for yeah. folks of other and in other communities. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah. That makes Thank you. Yes, it any does. Sense. Makes sense. <laughs> okay. So, I I'm so glad you asked this question because I've been watching um, people lately uh, let's say in the last couple of years, talk about um, interdisciplinary work and, and of course, and also cross uh, community work, which is really, really important. You can't do, you can't, you can't do work today without being that way, right? Um, but what I've noticed is that um, there's a, a new kind of hesitancy that we have about talking, you know, and this is, it's like, it's real respectful. That's what I love about it. It's like there's a humility that people are approaching the work with whether it's work in the academy, writing, researching, you know, trying to apply different um, theories that maybe were located in, in one field of study to another, um, which has been real interesting, it's real fruitful, super productive. The only thing that has been like kind of curious to me is how hesitant we are because we are so respectful. We, we want to say, we know that there are parts of the black radical truth that, I mean, it's black. You know, it's not, it's not, it's, when, when, when Cedric Robinson thought about this, he thought about it as specific to the black um, experience, right? So people, in seeing the usefulness of it and seeing its applicability to other places and people and um, spaces, have, I mean, they rightly used this. This is uh, this is why he made it. It's just because it's, it's so useful, and and also because of the general critique of people who are always talking about us, right? Who aren't us. Um, so it's good, um, and I think a certain kind of um, a, a kind of play and um, innovation is important. And the and the humility and the hesitancy, I think, comes from people not wanting to appropriate disrespectfully they want to make sure to attribute these thoughts to the places where they th were located but I think it's also caused a bit of um, it, it almost too much hesitancy like we're, we're, we're too shy almost to say why these things are important I think the reason why maybe is because not enough work has come out yet that talks about why it's important to do the work how you know the vernaculars of doing it the 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 like the um the discourse people do it but we're not talking about what are the politics of doing it. maybe i need to write something about that we need to write something about that <laughs> yeah. about like what so what what so what are the problems but also the possibilities of using the black, black radical tradition for example to talk about the immigration um issues that people face today 
it's 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 in many respects a no-brainer. It you, we have to because there is an incredible tradition of radicalism that exists in so many parts of the different communities that are adversely affected by the terrible racist uh, policies that are set up to exclude um, Latino Latina people, right? And and then you know communities of women and communities of trans folks and folks that. Um, themselves are coming from a, a, a place of situated knowledge to offer stellar, uh, incredible models of trans community uh, organizing and, and mobilization. So I, mean, I think that when we think, when we think about this work and how, um, and, how, and, how, and it's sort of mutual relevance, then we got to figure out a way to, um, to know it um, and also use it. And the only way you can do that, honestly, is like you, you gotta just decide you're gonna read and you're, gonna, and you're, and you're also gonna know the stories. Because um, a lot of times, especially in the academy, I think we get, we get a lot of, we get props. I mean, I, I know all the time I get this wonderful assignation, which I try to make true. I try to, to make good on it about being somebody who is, is a scholar of communities and who, but you know, it doesn't, I also notice too, that it doesn't take much for professors to be called community scholars. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, I mean, we can get that dap every day if we want to in front of the club. People, oh, she's an activist scholar. And, and, and it's like, well, really? What, so what, what you been doing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you showed up to this rally. Okay, cool. That's great. <laughs> but like, that's not the work, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not. And, and I, I'll tell you, I'll be the first to tell you. I don't really, I don't really have time to do the work. I try to do it. I try to make good on on what people say about me. I try to be true and and right and righteous about that. Um, um, but 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 there are costs. I mean, you got you you if you're going to be a professor in a research one university, there are costs to that kind of um, uh, the way you use your time in that way. So why did I say that? I said that because. Um, Oh, because we, we need to know the stories of what's going on. You can't just uh, go read about something, you know, and then say that, uh, I mean, you, you can, you, believe me, people built their careers on doing that, and it works. <laughs> but, 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 but to really do that work, I think, that interdisciplinary work to locate black radicalism in, and, and the future of black radicalism in the situated knowledge, you gotta be willing to show up for those 25 losses before you get the one win, you know, or which is, is it's just like, oh, you know, Rafa, you know that work is like exhausting and, and years in the making. And I think about the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters mm -hmm. and Maids who went all those years, not one win, but eventually, yes, but we're talking about people who died before any of this was realized and fought and fought and fought. And, and so to know those stories, but also to read the stuff so that you uh, develop we develop together, uh, individual, but also collective confidence about like, yes, see, I know these things. I know these things, I've read them, but I've also been in these places as much as I can be. So I feel like I can stand here and talk to you about them. And I, I feel like I can say them and be right about it, that, that I'm using this to talk about immigration because let me tell you why, because this is how it works. It doesn't take anything. In fact, we have so much to learn from the black radical tradition about this precisely because these people were located in a black experience. Let me tell you why it works for this that we're talking about in South LA, which is now mostly Latino. Right? So it, we got to know these things. We got to say, all right, we're, we're going to engage in this ruthless and constructive criticism because we're committed to the stories, which is really to honor the histories. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> I don't feel like I answered your question. Really cool. <laughs> now, uh, now you mentioned the importance of sort of going in and uh, unearthing the stories, and especially, and you you talk a lot about like reading the stories in the written context. Mm -hmm. But we also know that it it could be powerful to also listen to the stories, uh, and particularly listen to the stories through song. Yeah. Uh, and we know, so uh, what I'm suggesting is that music is an, also an important part of unearthing the black experience that gets, uh, that becomes a, a component of black radicalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want you to talk about the role of music and other forms of cultural expression. And we also, 
can't have Chuck D in the house and not talk about music. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I want you to just speak a little bit about that. Okay. Thanks. One of the, yes, um, my husband is here, he's in the back. And he, um, and yes, and, and so I'm not a practitioner, but I, 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 have, I think I have a good ear, sort of. Like, I mean, maybe not compared to some of the other musicians in here, but I have a good ear. But I also just have, a, um, I have, I have an appreciation for what music is as a lens through which to see um, the, the kind of freedom dreams that, that Robin talks about, the kind of new imaginaries that are created in song that can't be uttered in other places and spaces. I mean, this has been the tradition of our, all of our people who are part of aggrieved communities is that there's just things you can't say sometimes. I mean, I even feel that way now sometimes in, 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 in the classroom where, you know, there's things that are happening, you can't, you, 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 there's the dynamics at work, people complain about you to the dean or, you know, whatever. You can't, there's certain things you can't say, but you're really happy when the student raises their hand and says what you want to say. Mm -hmm. This is why a lot of people don't understand. I'm looking at a lot of students here and you think, oh, you know, I don't, I'm just here and no, we count on you. We count on you. We need you there, you know, because this is the, this is the the story now. Increasingly, is that we're silenced. We were just talking before about the the, the Trump rally where all these black students are ejected mm -hmm. from, right? Doing nothing, right? Just standing there. But because they've already been identified as aliens to the place actually that they pay tuition to be, um, you know, they, it's natural that they be ejected. There's a way that. Um, through popular culture, and I think increasingly now, it's kind of like there's a strange moment here we have where we kind of think we've gained entree to a sort of mainstream because we see a lot of ourselves on television. You know, you do, but but the Oscars are telling, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, telling. But you see a lot of us on TV. They love us. Oh. They love us. They love our stories. They love they love what we do. Like Eric Lott, Eric, Love and Theft. They love us. Love us, right? But we. We're not um, really a meaningful part of it. But more and more, I was mentioning this at the Black Studies Roundtable last week, that um, I noticed that more and more people think they know me, too. They know us well because they see these representations of us on television, but they're also listening to the music that we create. That um, we create, in part, mediated, of course, by people who hold the keys that decide what's going to sell and who's going to buy it and why. We know this story. but to preserve the part of it that continues to be what it's always been for us, which is a lens of possibility, which is a means to create something new where something is not supposed to be created. Um, technologies of expression that use um, equipment that is not intended for that, it's not designed for that. Um, and also, um, also sounds, I think, too, sounds that allow us to project ourselves into the future. And this is part of, I mean, we, what we were talking yesterday about the futures of black radicalism, there came up this distinction between Afrofuturism and then, and, and like how we're thinking about the future of black people. And the, so much of Afrofuturism is located in music, that in, in um, so and Del, um, you know, the funky Homo sapien in um, Black Star, in so many people who are talking, who are Black people, Janelle Parliament, Monet, Parliament, 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 all everybody. these people have been doing it. Sun Ra have <laughs> been doing it forever. Who have been saying, "Hey, I see us in the future." It's like, wow, really? Because we really aren't <laughs> sure of the future. And but so that was actually quite radical to imagine. Oh, I want to live on Mars. I want to live on Saturn. Even Stevie Wonder, people talking about living somewhere else. It's a radical thought, actually, to mm -hmm. say not just that you could escape this world, but that uh, also echoing you know, from the 1800s that this world really doesn't have anything that was designed for us. In fact, it was built on our exclusion, so we'll find something completely different. A lot of the stuff that people project in music about the future of black people is rooted also in you know, patriarchy and, and all kinds of very pop problematic politics. But music, I think, continues to be a place where many different kinds of people can come together, where many different kinds of intellectualisms are possible, um, where people can offer critiques and they can offer visions that, um, that are, are problematic, but also are open to critique in a different kind of way. And that's one thing that technology has done very well for us, is that anybody can upload something. On, mm -hmm. you, know, you could say just about anything and uh, anywhere, and somebody's gonna pick it up somewhere. So it allows us to, to, to have a comment and a larger conversation. So I don't know, I think that's how music has been to me. I, rem I think of also Josephine Baker, who mm -hmm. you know, was not a musician, 
I mean, it's, it's strange to imagine. A lot of people are like, who's that? It's a really, really incredible, really an artist. She, she said, I was not an, I'm not an artist, but she made her, she made her fame in, what was it, the 30s, was it the 30s? 20s, 20s, 20s yeah. yeah. In France, she became a star. She's from the United yeah, States, yeah. Black, black woman over there. She's a burlesque dancer. She became very, very famous. Um, but she said, I've never been an artist, actually, but I've always loved art because I've loved the universal humanity that I find in art. And I've tried to support it with everything I've got. And so that's why I feel like it can be, make this into a better um, place. So, so there's that. And then finally, also, there's the, the fact that most of the people that look like us, that talk, uh, um, um, like, uh, talk in the ways that we're used to, that we call home, and you know, increasingly, I'm talking to a more middle class, an upper middle class group of people of color and marginalized whites in, in, in a research one university. But still, we have a close relationship to people and times where we weren't welcome here at all. And so more and more, I think also we have to um, understand that segregation is actually getting worse in, in K through 12, you know, that things are, things are um, not getting better um, for in terms of black futures. Um, so knowing that, then we, we have to deploy multiple languages and we have to re remember that this is not the only conversation that we should be having. Wow. Now, in your answer <clears throat> towards the beginning, you mentioned the appearance of more folks who look like us on mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, television, movies, but uh, arguably one of the most mainstream faces has been uh, the President of the United States, uh, Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Professor Johnson actually is close friends with oh, Barack no, Obama from back in the day. <laughs> he is embellishing greatly. He, he, he couldn't be here today. <laughs> he had a prior engagement, but he sends his wishes. <laughs> but, uh, right, right, right. <laughs> but what the Obama presidency has shown us is uh, a very intense racial polarization in the United States. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a polarization that was already there, sort of latent, mm -hmm. and folks want to pretend like all of a sudden now, you know, black folks are getting killed by the police all of a sudden, right. just now, yeah. right? Yeah. But his presidency has illuminated a lot of the racial polarization that has been in place for a while in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. So. Uh, could we talk about the role that, uh, you know, what we've seen, especially you've been thinking about this for the past three years, five years, uh, which would fit within the presidency, and now as, as he's transitioning out of office, you know, what do you expect for black, ra <clears throat> black radicalism moving forward in, a, in an era where the, you know, the face of the United States isn't a black face anymore? You know, is there does the the strategies for radicalism change, mm -hmm. uh, and then you could also tell, share their, share your story about how you met Mr. Mr. Obama. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll say that first. I when I went to um, after college, I went to I was working in Chicago, and um, my boss was Michelle Obama, and this was before all the everything before they had kids before he met. I was saying yesterday to Jonathan that. Okay. That he used to come, like, you know, hang with, out with some of us and say, oh, well, you know, I was thinking about running for senator. We were like, yeah, right. You're never going to be a senator. What are you talking about? And, and we all used to laugh, like, not to his face, you know, but, we were like, he, you know, but then, then we're like, we saw, you know, the word, like, he's, he's president. Oh my God. But, um, but you know, it's just incredible because, I mean, living, like, they lived in Hyde Park and we worked downtown mostly, but we were doing a lot of really good work on the South Side trying to. We're, we're thinking about um, redevelopment projects with the Center for New Horizons and Akhenaten. Um, they're kind of, they were experiments, long-term experiments in, in really black economy. And so, um, yeah. Um, but the thing about it is, like I, I always have said that, like my generation is, I was born in 1972. And so, everybody's doing the math, like okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carry the two. Let's carry the two. I know. <laughs> um, that um, my generation, like I, we like to talk a lot about civil rights and like that, but we were shaped by the conservative backlash against it. 
that's that's what I was shaped by. You know, my, my schooling, everything that I experienced as a child growing up was a was shaped by the conservative backlash, but also also by the resistance that people had to it, which was really really an amazing time to grow up. But today, like now, you talk about Obama's presidency has been the whole thing has con been constituted by a backlash in many respects. So now, whoever's been born in these last eight years, or and what they're going to see from now on, I mean, it's so it's so interesting. And people say, oh, you know, wow, I was born when there was a black president, or I was there when there was a black president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's been amazing. I mean, to have seen that and to witness what it means to people who have are still alive who fought that fight in in the 50s, right? I mean, who, who understand, it's not even that fighting that fight. I mean, honestly, like I, I think about my, some of the most enduring stories that my father tells, who went to, high, he started high school in 61, he graduated from college in 69. So he was really like, but that means he was going to segregated schools in Chicago in the 50s. So some of the most enduring stories that I hear from him and from my mom Whose family is also his family is originally from San Luis Potosí, but is it grew up? She grew up in Chicago on the South Side as well. Are about the indignities that they suffered as children, what it meant to be bussed and harassed and have rocks thrown at you and to be called names and and I mean like for real, for real, not just like the story we tell about what well, we got called a name in in middle school, but like every day getting off the bus and fearing life, you know that that kind of stuff, or or just the little things of like. You know, um, I mean, my father tells these stories about how on the weekends, uh, he and his father would take him to the north side and they would polish the, you know, the little uh, metal brass plates that go in, in hotels that go over the door um, threshold, like that you walk on. They would polish those and polish the banisters on the stairs. And the way they were really rendered completely invisible, he doesn't say it in that language, but like people treat them like they were decorations, you know. And I think of how hard my grandfather worked, how. He, my, my father remembered him crying one day, and he was so shocked by it. Like, oh my God, my dad's crying. Why are you crying? Because I don't have enough money to give you to take the bus tomorrow. And he was a bus driver. You know, like those things that, that are the indignities of everyday life that we don't know when we tell that one story. Not to, take a, not to diminish it, but when we tell that one story about being called whatever in seventh grade, we're talking about a lifetime shaped by those indignities and then somehow overcoming those things, but how through community, through collectives that say, no, you're worth something, through music that says black is beautiful, that, you know, the, through the staple singers, to, through all these people who reimagined black people and what black life and black worth was. So I want that for people who are gonna be shaped by this conservative backlash against Obama and everything they think he stood for. Obama from the get was like, I'm a conservative Democrat. That's just who I am. So a lot of people who were disappointed by him, yeah, we, there's a lot of things we need to be disappointed about. Um, although many of us who are disappointed by him also don't understand the structure of the presidency and what it means to lead, in quotes. But we also, I think, um, we also, I mean, I, I took him at his word when he went in. <clears throat> He's a conservative Democrat. He was going to be appeasing a lot of people. But I don't think, I don't know how people are prepared for that kind of caricature of your children in the mass media of the terrible things they've said about Michelle Obama. I mean, you Google her name and you look through the images, there's pictures of monkeys and like animals and their kids too, you know? And so, so the, that conservative backlash, I think, is going to last. We think, we keep thinking about Super Tuesday and all that. The Tea Party has won in the midterm elections. They, they won. I mean, so until the early 2020s, we're looking at the conservative backlash because they swept the midterm elections. Mm -hmm. and, and they did that because of the conservative backlash. So I'm not trying to say that we have a, a terrible time coming, but I am saying that. We have um, Donald Trump, though, we, so we might hello. have a terrible time. Oh my God. <laughs> we, might have know, terrible we might have a terrible time, time coming. <laughs> 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 right. right. <laughs> Oh my God! Even the Republicans are like, "Oh no, what have we done?" You know, but this is what happens when you create that unimpeachable discourse about what 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 it means to have leadership that's progressive, that it's bad. So this is what happens. This is this is like really seriously. It's 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 the dog coming back, back to bite, and I love dogs, but to come back and bite you, right? For real. And that's that's what ha what's happened. It's like even to conservatives who are laughing at Trump. Mm -hmm. 
now it's like, oh, here's what you get. <laughs> For real. <laughs> You're embarrassed, but you better get used to it and better be proud of it. And they'll find a way. They'll find a way. But we have to be also then dedicated because this is this is why so so much of the radicalism that has sprung up, shaped in large part by women, um, has happened because we don't have nothing to lose. I mean, and people understand that that every day, if you you're afraid that you know your your that your children are going to be locked up, like really, my 11 year old's going to be in detention for real with me or without me, or I'm going to be I gotta have Plan B for my kids because I might not come home today. Um, I might not come home today, even though also I'm an authorized person in the United States. I own my own home, but I could get shot because people think that I don't live in this neighborhood. We were just talking about that. Um, it's real. It's it's absolutely real. So yeah, it's it's scary, but also you know this is a time when again summoning ourselves and being clear about who we are and having the confidence is um, it's really important. But unfortunately, I think a lot of us think we don't live in that moment, but we do. It is. It it has come. It's here. Yeah. Well. Now we want to take a few minutes to open it up to Q&A, uh, but before we open it up, I want to say that there are uh, refreshments, food, mm -hmm. being served over in the Bunch Library across the hall immediately following uh, this conversation, so feel free to go in there and in enjoy what college students love most, which is free food. <laughs> and professor students. And, prof and graduate students. <laughs> I already have my Tupperware. So. <laughs> But anyone uh, who would have a, who has a question for, for Professor Johnson, or you, or me, mm -hmm. or me. Uh, peace, my name is Osceola. Uh, I guess my first question would be around um, what happens. In, oh, I've seen it. What happens in the wake of displacement? Uh, I seen that you wrote about you know the Chavez Ravine and how that was kind of bulldozed, and in the era of gentrification, I was wondering about what happens in the wake of that. And then I have another question. Uh, which is about Obama, and Obama himself is kind of projected into a global space as a representation of black collusion with empire. So when we think about black radicalism in the future and thinking globally as you, as you rooted the black radical tradition in a global sense, do we have a responsibility to respond to that representation and symbolism as black people operating um, within the United States? And then Another question I had is about kind of music as a side of resistance. I know you've done work around war, and, and when you interviewed Santana, they said they were in, uh, influenced by Earth, Wind, and Fire. Now I'm kind of questioning how we deal with this corporatized music structure um, that kind of strips music of its resistance, and MCs like, like Tef Poe are continually uh, buried, so that uh, excavation of music as a side of resistance would require kind of combing with a, a fine tooth comb and, and really engage in the community um, so I, I was wondering about that. Uh, I have more questions, but I'll wait. <laughs> Bring them to the uh, to the ex the refreshment session yes. too. No, but I, I've heard this brother speak in class, and, and all his questions are are like they're so just generative, and everything that you ask is always like incredible for thinking about the future of how we should be speaking about these things. So thank you. Actually, I hope that people won't mind, but especially that Chuck won't mind if, if we make this like kind of a conversation, because that last question, I think, you know, you have really like the foremost expert on what that is about, about corporatization in the room. And so, so will you mind? He's back there ducking probably. <laughs> but this last question, well, this, um, uh, well, maybe you could uh, ask well, it one more time. You can ask, what about, uh, that I last think, one. I think one thing that affects any movement in culture and music is when you individualize people. And when you talk about Santana being influenced by Earth, Wind, and Fire, what you had is you had automatic collectives just by being a band and they're in sync with each other. I'm not saying we don't have collectives today, but we have individual mind production satellites that choose to come together when they feel like coming together, when they see link ups, and, and also drift apart. So that's a big difference is that today is individualized and not these collectives that they had to deal with. And then when collectives got with collectives musically, it was it was over. It was festival, right? you know, with, with with protest movement. Yeah, the disappearance of groups for real. It's true, yeah. Um, and the, and and that's is in in any way in any kind of like even war situation like to, when they isolate you, then you know it's a wrap. You know, usually, and then you have to speak for everything, 
everybody. Um, and that's also, I think this is the, like the discursive tool too of um, putting Mike Brown and um, Tamir Rice children on trial really for mm -hmm. whether they were human enough to be kept alive. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't even, it isn't even about, I mean, I mean the, the question gets asked like, were they guilty of doing something, you know? But the, really the, the question is like, are they all guilty of doing something? Um, and are they capable of not, I, I mean, are they capable of a life without our management of their freedom, of their incarceration, of their whatever? Um, so, uh, but uh, based on the gentrification thing, thank you so much for asking that question. I know you guys are also uh, reading that, that, the book for, um, for like next week or something, right, too, which is cool, which is really, yeah. And, um, and so writing about Chavez Ravine, it was so instructive for me because I have heard the, I'd seen the documentary and I'd, heard, but I thought, what is it, what, what, it, what does it mean when you erase people? Like I wrote, like from maps even, like, I, like they never even existed. So what happens then in the wake of that? One of the things that I was talking about in, in Spaces of Conflict was, was the way then that people sort of make up for it, they compensate for it discursively by claiming space. But I had to also be really clear that that is no, in this economy, there, that is no substitute for asset or ownership. So if you lose your house, it, it's not, not to diminish what people do at an A&W drive-through, or not to diminish the concert that people put on that say, I belong here, this was my neighborhood, and, and it, I may not own a house here anymore, but this is my place, and I will play this music here, and you will hear it, and I will, I will, I will uh, cruise through here like I still own it. Those things mean something, and I, I really wanted to further that in the book, but I also was very careful to say, but that also doesn't substitute for asset ownership, which is really the only measure of one's worth in this society. So in the wake of that, I think, you know, people are really trying. I mean, these are the models that people are, are, are that we can be inspired by, but LA Can and, and so many other organizations that are saying, you know, housing is a human right. And um, I mean, let alone asset ownership, but that we, we have a right not only to be housed, but also to be here. And so, I mean, I think in the, in the wake of this, in the wake of displacement where, and it, it, let's just be honest, like it's been very successful, like sweeping us out of place, all of us. I mean, it's like, okay, well, we decide that we're gonna get, be done with this, and we don't even have to use eminent domain anymore. You could just say, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna place this art gallery right here, in this, and people that are there are like, okay, you know, who are all these artists coming in or whatever, right? <laughs> but all the people who usually go frequent, it's like, okay, that's an invitation. It's a sort of implicit sanction of like, you know, come on in, you know, and this is what we're gonna turn it into um, in so many ways, right? Um, in the wake of that, I think we're gonna have to come up with something really based in that notion of entitlement and in that notion of we really don't have even our assets to lose anymore. We have to also, I think, do something that, um, that I think Cedric Robinson has been so great about um, doing throughout all his work, but also so many of the black scholars that have come after him have created like alternative modes of value alternative modes of critique, alternative modes of freedom that are not just things that we theorize about, that we write, that we play with, you know, but serious, um, serious collective established ways of ownership. What are the things that we're gonna own that are our legacy, that are going to mean something for our children and for other people's children? What are the things that are gonna keep us alive? And I think we're in that moment right now where we have to redefine what life is for us. Too long, we've been defined by asset ownership and capital accumulation. There's got to be another way. And this is why in the black radical tradition, we see, I mean, birds are everything, you know, in, in, and because of what they mean for flight and freedom and, and, and bringing us back to ancestry. They, it's something only has you know, as much value as we assign to it. And even though we live in this context, and, and it's easy for me to say as a home owner, um, in which assets are valued, there's gotta be another way that we can assign value to other things. And that means also we gotta get up out, like it's like swimming through molasses with boots on, trying to be in this environment where everything that we value is told to, like you must value this, this is the thing you value next, this is the thing you buy next. 
I was talking about this a couple weeks ago, where you know now you walk on campus, everywhere is a billboard for something, and we we are you know the, on on move-in night, they're taking kids to, um, they're taking freshmen to to Target for these like, in, in, these these like parties, right? But bring your <laughs> bring your wallet, you know, because we're we're here to provide you with everything you forgot. Um, this is this is the corporate nexus, is the campus. So if we're so we're so in, imbued with it. We we think we know what it means, what value is. We don't. We don't. We, we got to think together about that. What what do we value, and how can we have it? We, how can we own it, and nobody can take it from us? It might not be assets. It might be something else. It might be life. You know. It might be. It might be underground railroad. What Clue is doing. You know, with with refuge and like, like we were, we were talking about that yesterday. I think or somebody and I. But. We're, but no, it was someone else. But we, but we, but but it, it's 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 life. It's value. It's the unmistakable conviction that we should be able to identify in each other that we're committed to the abolition of oppression for each other and for everyone else. That's life. That's value to me. But we got to work on it. Can we give Professor Johnson a round of applause? <laughs> And Jonathan, too, and please. Yes. Incredible yes. questions. Yes. Yes. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation in an informal way over in the Bunch Library. Thank you to everyone who came and participated and showed face. It was great to see all of these faces here today. Thank you again to the Institute of American Cultures, Dr. Tucker, for joining us. Yes, thank you so much. Chicano Study Center, the uh, uh, Ralph Bunch Center for African American Studies. Um, Professor Johnson, again, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so we, we need to like build.